And greetings once again, AP Calc BC students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School. We're going to take a look at our second example out of our topic 10.15, which is all about uh, representing functions as power series. And what we're going to be focusing on now is going to play a prominent role pretty much from here on to the rest of uh, the end of Unit 10, Topic 15. And that's going to be using composite functions. And so we're talking about a function within another function that you can kind of manipulate a little bit and write a power series. But before we begin with this example, I want to uh, just enlighten you on some various uh, operations that you can perform uh, with uh, composite functions in the realm of the power series. So by that, what I mean is if you've got a function f of x that's represented by this particular power series, summation of a sub n times x to the n, and then we'll call g of x another summation b sub n times x to, to the n. I know that these are centered at zero, but that's neither here nor there. It doesn't matter where we're centered. It, it works uh, uh, as long as your centering is consistent. And what we're going to do is problem uh, one here, or, or property one is think about, well, what is the series going to look like for f of k times x, a constant multiple k mul uh, in front of the x? Well, as you can probably imagine, you would just simply use the power series that you already had for f of x, but swap the x out and replace it with k times x. That's the only thing that you have to do. And at that point, you could rewrite it where k is both given the power of n and x is the power of n if you so chose to do that. But it's really that easy. In other words, if you've got a basic power series and all you've got to do is manipulate it with that constant multiple in front of the x that's in your given function, just make the swap in the power series. It works the same way if your x is raised to the nth power. You would just simply go into your power series here for f, swap the x out, and replace it with x to the capital N power. And then at that point, you could multiply your two powers together as the rule indicates. And then lastly, and I think this is probably going to be more logical, is that if you're adding or subtracting a couple of functions that are represented by power series, you can go ahead and just combine them. You can add or subtract the power series. And in this particular case, we kind of factored out this x to the n and wrote it at the end um, as the a sub n and the b sub n are going to sort of work together as the coefficient of that x sub n. And so a lot of these are probably things that you would assume to have been true in the first place. Now, one thing that I want to point out in the box off to the right, it says that these operations described here uh, can change the interval of convergence for the resulting series. And a, a perfect example would be looking at the interval of convergence for the sum of, say, uh, the power series x to the n and the power series 1 half uh, x to the n. And if we were to combine those, it turns out that the resulting interval of convergence really turns out to be the intersection of those two. And I think we're going to be working on problems like that. Um, if not in the lecture series, certainly in your skill builders, you're going to be playing around with that. Uh, a lot of times students may not worry so much about that and just worry about finding the resulting uh, interval of convergence if it's asked for by just using, say, the, the Power, uh, the, uh, the ratio test like we did before, but this can definitely save some time. So let's do it. Let's look at our problems here. Example two, finding the Maclaurin series for each of these following functions. And it says, be sure to, whoa, what's that say? Be sure to list the first three non-zero terms and the general term, which again, very common thing to do on the AP exam. So Sine of x squared. Well, let me think about this. One thing that we could certainly do is we could build this from scratch, right? We could take several derivatives of sine of x squared. But, you know, who wants to do that, right? I, I don't want to do that. That's not going to be any fun, sine of x squared. Because by the time you take the first derivative, okay, it's sine of x squared times 2 times x, right? Well, then... From that point on, our derivatives are going to involve very nasty product rules the rest of the way out. And there's a better way to do that, and that would be by using the composite rule. Now, remember when we talked about if you could memorize a few really key 
power series that are commonly used, it could save you a lot of time. And that's what I'm talking about right now. Because you kind of need to know what the power series is for sine of x. You need to have that memorized in order to really make this process go quickly. So what is the power series for sine of x? Well, guess what? I just happen to have it down there below. And it's this alternating odd sequence of, of, of uh, components that we see here. And notice I have both the uh, first four non-zero terms and the general term for that. So for this particular problem, basically all you would do is go into this and you would swap out the x and replace it with the x squared. And so if we do that, the x here is going to become x squared. The x cubed is actually going to be, well, okay, well, temporarily we can just call it x squared all cubed and put that all over 3 factorial. And then the next term would be a plus, and then we'll swap out the x with an x squared, raise it to the fifth power, and place that over the 5 factorial. And that would be certainly uh, a way that you could list the first three non-zero terms. You don't have to separate them with the minus and the plus. You could have written them like A1, A2, and A3, and that would be okay. Um, if you want to simplify them, you could. Again, you're not obligated to, but just don't make any silly mistakes and like add the exponents or something like that. You are going to be multiplying the exponents in this case. And so this is what you would have. Now, as far as the general term is concerned, the general term would look something like this. Well, let's see, I got minus dot, 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 and then maybe plus. Don't read too much into these signs because it, it, I know that this is supposed to be an alternating series, but it really doesn't make a lot of difference because you can always adjust a minus with whatever uh, value you have in front of the next term that's not going to be revealed. But in this particular case, we're just going to go into our... Uh, nth term expression here, and we're going to change the x to an x squared. Now, notice that there still is a 2n plus 1 around him, and of course, the 2n plus 1 factorial is still a part of the denominator, and at that point, we could also do some simplifying to the extent of the 2 and the 2n plus 1 all being multiplied. Now, make sure you distribute if you decide to do that. It's very important. And this would suffice as your nth term. So we got our sine of x squared all taken care of. All right, well, let's do the same thing for cosine. Like you could imagine, it's going to be very important that you recall what is the power series for just plain old cosine. Because once we determine that, we can just swap out the x with, well, the square root of x, which is also x to the half, of course. And so the cosine, I just happen to have it here for you in case you've forgotten. And so we start it with 1 minus, and then as I said before, the x replaces with, I can go ahead and use square root of x here. I think that's going to work fine for us. And then I'll use square root of x again for this third non-zero term. And that's the non-simplified version. And then if I move on to the general term, unsimplified, then as you can see, I would just simply replace that x with square root of x. And then I'll worry about simplifying it a bit later. So if I do simplify, the square root of x squared, of course, is just going to be an x um, over 2 factorial. I could write 2. I could write 2 factorial. No big deal. Square root of x to the fourth, that would be x to the half to the fourth, which would be an x squared. And then if I go ahead and simplify over here, then we'll basically this one half power wrapped around the x multiplies by the 2n, and I end up with just x to the nth power. And then 2n quantity, or 2n in parentheses here, would end up being our general term. And because I didn't write equal signs, I, I'm good with the way that I've expressed this. There's nothing wrong with it. I've generally answered the question. But one of the things that I want to safeguard against is if I wrote an equals here, then I don't like the fact that I stopped at the nth term. I probably should have done this to indicate that we're going on forever. Just 
by the <laughs> mere action of putting an equal sign and linking this back to what's up on top. I don't think that's something you should worry a whole heck of a lot about, but you know, through the course of making these videos, I do like to demonstrate correct mathematics and correct notation. So that really is it. That's your first foyer into working with composite functions. And I hope that you all understand the magnitude of this particular skill. Because if you think back to your days um, in integration, the integral of sine of x squared is something that we could not do. However, if we write this as a power series, the game changes because we can now integrate a power series. So that's where this is ultimately going to lead when we get to the end of topic 1015. Anyway, I hope this helps. We'll see you next time.